Okay, so the next talk is going to be by me. <laughs> right, so um, short introduction. I'm Mark Lemberg. I'm the chair of the Europython Society, and I've been doing this for five years, and um, now going to present uh, how we run Europython and uh, what we will need to do to prepare for next year's conference, which will hopefully be in Dublin in July. So, right, there's the share. Uh, we are, we've scheduled the, the conference for July 11th to 17th next year. So in summer again, like we usually do. Europython typically happens in, in July. Uh, and I, I wrote plan because, right, so we still have COVID around and it's not really clear what the situation will be in July next year. Um, there might be some things, you know, that which get in our way. So we might have to do it online again, which we would really like to avoid, but you know, that's how it is. Um, hopefully it will happen in Dublin and let's be positive. <laughs> let's, let's just assume it will be in Dublin. So let me just go over uh, how everything works. Right. So the organization behind Europython is the Europython Society, and the abbreviation is EPS for that. So that's what you're going to see a lot in, in the talk. The EPS was founded in 2004 to run Europython to provide a legal background, a uh, legal framework to, to, in, to write, uh, you know, enter contracts and so on for Europython. Uh, it was found in Göteborg. Um, initially, it just managed the selection process for Europython, so it didn't really enter contracts for Europython, but just uh, managed selecting local teams that then run the Europython event. And that has worked for, for a couple of years while Europython was still smaller. But then over the years, Europython grew so much that the financial risk uh, being taken on by the local organizations was just too much to handle. So we had to basically take over that part. And uh, now we run Europython uh, as, you know, it's, it's uh, signed off by, by the Europython Society and it's also financially backed by the Europython Society. Um, at first we, we were, continued to work with local organizers uh, in seven, 2017 that basically stopped and we're now using a fully remote working mode. So it's it's easy for you to, to join us, to help us uh, and to participate in organizing Europython. So what's the purpose of the EPS? Well, first of all, of course, running the Europython conference series. Uh, then some years ago, we extended the scope. So we added the additional scope to provide support for the European Python community. So what we do is we provide conference grants and project grants uh, to other conferences in Europe. So our scope is specifically the geographic Europe. Um, so if you have a conference, if you have a, a project that you want to run, you need some funding, then, then please approach us. You can write to grants at europypython.eu We'll go to our website, to the resources, and then you find the links there and also how to apply. Um, the other part that we do is we protect the IP in Europython. So we have trademarks on the term Europython uh, on the logos. And of course, we maintain the social accounts for Europython. Now, how does the EPS work? Like I mentioned, we now have a fully remote and decentralized work model. We have set up a number of work groups where people can then join and then uh, work on a particular part of the conference organization. The advantage of having these work groups is that we don't, uh, or we no longer lose as much institutional knowledge when, uh, when people you know, step in and, or step out of the organization. So uh, usually we have quite a few people who stay on from one year to the next, and then the, the knowledge can easily be passed on. In the past, we always had the issue that every local organization, for example, they had to basically rebuild this institutional knowledge, and that was a, a major source of um, problems. So the EPS also takes the financial risk on everything, enters contracts, maintains the sponsor relationships across the years, which makes getting sponsors a lot easier. And we uh, also deal with taxes, usually using a local accountant that we get, for example, in Dublin. 
Uh, in terms of financial risk, to give you an idea, the, the budget that we are maintaining for an in-person conference is around 600 to 650,000 euros. Uh, that's a lot of money, and uh, we have to, you know, properly handle everything. So it's a, it's actually a larger um, undertaking to make sure that the money is used correctly and that we don't lose money. Um, the EPS structure, the organizational structure, is also very simple. We have a board of uh, up to nine members, uh, and it's an active board. So the the board members are actually the most or usually the most active people working in the organization of the conference. And then we have a number of work groups that I'm going to get to um, in the next couple of slides. Plus, of course, we have the members. Anyone can sign up as a member. Um, the members have to be voted in by the board. And then you have, uh, when you have the EPS membership, then you can also participate in the general assembly that we're going to have later this year uh, to vote in the new board. And to some extent, we also include the Europython attendees into our organization. So we listen to them a lot and uh, we, we pay attention to what the attendees want. So a short overview of how the, the conference developed. It all started in 2002 in Charleroi in Belgium. Uh, there we had 250, you know, 240 people. Um, that was the very first Europython. It was it was a lot of work. We had lots of discussions, uh, but it, it was also a lot of fun. We had sandwiches for lunch, for example, and just water bottles. That was our lunch. It's not like you catering that you get nowadays. Um, we had lots of you know famous people there. We had Guido there. We had uh, Eric Raymond there. So that was that was nice. And then over the years, of course, we moved around in Europe because it's Euro Python, right? So we we move around from it. To, to different places in Europe. 2017 was in Rimini. Uh, we had Edinburgh, Scotland. We had Basel in Switzerland. And the last two years, or you know, this year and last year, were online. As you can see from the development of the attendee counts, uh, it's you know it's going been going up to around 1,200 people, uh, and then it, it kind of stays at 1,200 people. This year we we uh, added this view only ticket, and that gave us around 900 to about a thousand extra uh, tickets that we sold. So we're now at around uh, 2,100 tickets. Um, but you know whether you count those view only tickets as attendees or not is you know basically a viewpoint thing. So uh, these are the actual numbers that we have for conference tickets who actually attend the conference and participate directly in it. Here's a typical timeline of how the organization works. So what we are uh, doing every year is we have an RFP process, a request for proposal uh, process, which is a commercial process. This is what you do in um, when you do when you ask vendors to to send in uh, proposals, what we do is we send out these these RFPs to conference venues and then uh, with a long list of questions and then we we expect them to come back with a long list of answers for us and then we do two rounds, we filter out uh, the the most uh, interesting candidates and then we select one of those. Uh, this happens, it starts in September and then it continues uh, into October and November. Um, and then in the second round, we also contact local teams. Let's say we, we do a, a conference in, in Ireland, like what we planned for 2020. Uh, we would then, when, it's, when it becomes clear that uh, Ireland is one of the um, hosting places, then we contact the, the Irish local team there to make sure that there are no conflicts with the national conferences, right? Because uh, Py we have lots of PyCons in Europe, and so we don't want to step on anyone's toes, so we contact them to make sure everything is okay. And then we do the final selection. In December, we then announce, usually announce, the, the result of the RFP and the selection of the venue, and we then also announce the, the most likely a time in January, we have to finalize everything, so we have to sign the agreements, the contracts. We launched the uh, the pre-launch website, which basically has the initial information, and then we set up everything uh, to 
you know, make everything work. We have to have local uh, uh, local accountant. We have to register for VAT. We have to get the, the taxes working and the accounting. So that's done in January. In February, we typically then launch the website. This is done by the web work group. We decide uh, the budget and the ticket prices on the board. And in March, we start the CFP done by the program work group. Uh, and we also usually start the ticket sales. And this is managed by the web work group based on the the prices uh, that we decided in February. In March, April, we run the sponsor uh, signups and we create the sponsor brochure. This is done by the sponsors work group and the brochure, like everything else that has to do with marketing design is being done by the marketing design work group. And then in April, May, the program work group then has to do lots of work because they have to look at all the selections uh, in the CFP, they have to run the talk voting that we always do, which is something a bit special for EuroPython. So the attendees that we have, that people who have already bought a ticket, they can actually uh, submit their votes on the talks that were submitted. And then we use that as a basis to select the talks and then build the schedule. At that point, the uh, marketing design group starts working on the conference booklet once the schedule is done, because that's the main part of the conference booklet. Plus, we start the FinAid process. So the FinAid work group takes care of, um, you know, going through all the applications for FinAid and then selects the ones that uh, get the FinAid. In June, we have to then order material and take care of all the branding stuff done by the marketing design work group. The help desk has to be managed by the support work group. So that's when we get, well, actually, we, we start getting requests to the help desk earlier actually as, as soon as the ticket sale starts, but the, the main kind of period when things start for the support work group is before the conference. And then uh, we have to take care of logis logistics. So for example, getting our, our conference gear shipped to the, to the, uh, the, conference, the conference site, the venue, we have to set up a logistics a company that will then help us locally at the conference uh, venue location with you know accepting parcels from sponsors uh, from things that we order so that's a bit of uh, overhead this is usually done by by board members uh, not by a specific work group and then in july of course we have the conference and during the conference we have a registration desk that's uh, managed by the support work group um, this is like the on-site help desk that we have of course, they also have to continue working on the um, help desk application that we have on the website. Um, the sponsors work group will then have to take care of the sponsor handling, so making sure that the sponsors all feel uh, welcome and feel, um, you know, sort out all the issues that we sometimes have, like, for example, parcels missing or parcels uh, being delayed for some reason. Uh, we often have customs issues that we have to resolve, that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, we have the code of conduct work group, which uh, then takes care of any conduct issues that we might have at the conference. Um, something that happens basically throughout the year is communications. Uh, so posting to, to Twitter, to all the social channels that we have, um, and that's being done by the communication work group. So that's a, a quick overview of the timeline that we have. Now let's have a look at how the work groups work. So the work groups are usually structured, again, in a very simple way. We have one or two work group chairs, and we typically uh, have at least one of those be a board member. The reason there is uh, that we have to have a very good uh, connection between the work groups and the board so that the information flow is not hindered by, for example, having someone not being on the board and then that not knowing about uh, things that we decided on the board and then maybe we forget to, to communicate to the work groups. So that's very important. And then we have the work group members uh, who basically just, you know, in, in each work group uh, then help with the work that needs to be done. The workload in the work groups is usually depends a lot on, on the timeline. It depends a lot on where you, uh, in which area you work. Uh, sometimes you have lots of work to do before the conference. Sometimes you have lots of work at the conference or just before the conference. Depends a bit um, on how things go. 
Uh, one word about inactive members. Inactive members are people who've signed up but don't, don't actually do anything in the workgroups. Uh, we remove them from the workgroups because we don't want to uh, give the impression that we have enough workgroup members, whereas in, in reality, we don't have enough active members. So these are the workgroups that we have. We used to have administration and finance, but we folded those back into the EPS board because those two things are actually mostly done by the board anyway. Uh, we have a sponsors workgroup that does takes care of all the interaction with the sponsors. Uh, communications workgroup does all the communication, sends out emails, does the sponsor emails, for example, during, during the conference as well. Uh, works on Telegram make sure that everyone knows about everything. So that's communications. The support work group deals with all the help desk related things, the, um, uh, the registration desk, uh, everything that has to do with helping attendees, uh, you know, find their way to the conference and then navigate at the conference. We have a financial aid work group that uh, manages the financial aid budget, which is uh, quite sizable usually at, at the conference. So it's uh, something like between 10 to uh, 20,000 euros that we usually have as a budget. Uh, marketing design is everything that has to do with you know, graphics. Um, however, there's one important thing there. We don't design things ourselves. So what we do is we always hire a designer and we have a very good relationship with a designer uh, from Spain. And we always work with her to uh, basically get all the logos designed and the uh, you know selecting background images and, and things like that. So marketing design basically just takes care of making sure that everything is in place. And we then sometimes take the designs that the designers created and then we create things like um, you know, for example, the slide that you see here, the slide background was created by the marketing design work group. A program does everything that has to do with selecting talks and also does everything that has to do with uh, the making sure that the, the speakers feel uh, at home and answer any questions that they might have and do last minute changes uh, to, this, to the uh, schedule and so on. Web is everything, uh, everything website. So the website is hosted on uh, root servers that we have at Hetzner and we use Docker for running them and uh, the, the website is written in Django. So the web work group typically takes care of doing things like Django upgrades, adding new features, making changes. Uh, maybe for, for next year we will have a new layout then the web work group would work with the, with the company that basically helps us then to, to create a new layout and so on. So all of these things are web related. And then we have the media work group. Media uh, is at, at these online events is very important because we have lots of work to do with the, um, you know, getting things recorded, getting things online, uh, you know, like select the, the StreamYard thing, for example, is done by the media work group. Uh, at the conference itself, this is mostly about the video recording and making sure that happens. But uh, we might run next year as a hybrid event so that you can join online as well, in addition to in person. And so in that case, the media work group would have lots of lots to do as well. Finally, we have the conduct work group. Uh, this is closely integrated with the EPS board because when we're at the event, uh, we sometimes need to, you know, run quick decisions. And so that can only, the quick decisions can only be done by board members because they are responsible. Uh, and so we always need to have board members in the conduct work group. Right, so how does it work? How do we work together? We have pretty much standardized on Telegram groups. So we have quite a few Telegram groups that we use for this. We do have a couple of mailing lists as well. And then as the, the basically the uh, main uh, work, um, uh, let's say environment that we use for, for storing all the data, storing all the, the text documents, images, and so on. We use Google Docs, uh, Google Sheets, and Google Drive for this a lot. And uh, I didn't put that on the slide, but I should have. We all also, also have a project management system that we're using, it's called ClickUp. Yeah, and one final word, the chairs are responsible and accountable for what uh, the work groups have to do. So if something does not get done, then ultimately the chairs will have to then 
you know, step in and do the work. Uh, right, so that's the end of my, my uh, presentation. So uh, now I'm gonna have to hop over to the, the chat and see whether there are any questions. I don't see any questions, which is interesting. Is anyone listening to this talk? <laughs> okay, so the question is, how do I sign up as a volunteer? Let me, I have to do multitasking now, so I have to be speaker and the presenter at the same time. So how do I sign up as a volunteer? So that's, that's actually very easy. Um, I can show you, you go to the web page, open it, you know, Python Society, right? And let's move it over here. So this is the EuroPython Society page. Um, let me just check whether you can see that. Yes. Uh, and then over here, you go to um, you go to the resources page up here, and then uh, this has lots of information. Let me see where's the. Uh, this is just the page. This got uh, oops. This got redone. Um, a while ago. So I have some trouble finding it myself. Interesting. We should fix that. Um, anyway, the easiest way to contact us is you just go here to About Society. You scroll down uh, to the uh, email address, which uh, is supposed to be on this page, but it isn't. Oh my goodness, what is this? Uh, it's, um, the email address is board at europython.eu, so I could just could write it into the uh, board at europython.eu. So that's the email address. And then if you, uh, you know, just write there, then the board will get the message and then we can help you and uh, sign you up. What we did this year, and we're probably gonna do it next year again, is we had, uh, a, quite a few sessions where we invited people to online conferences, uh, to online uh, meetings. And then we basically walked them through the same kind of uh, slide deck that we have that I just presented, and then they can ask questions. So we announce, we're gonna announce these things on our blog. Um, so you just go to EuroPython Society, and then uh, we'll announce it here, and then you can sign up to those uh, meetings and we will then uh, take note of your uh, your name and your contact details and then we can sign you up to that. Right, let me see, anything else? Uh, in which areas are you looking for help? Very good question. So let me go back to the, um, to the slide with the work groups. So I marked all the, the ones that where we need uh, help, I marked them in red. So we need sponsors, we need more people's communications, we need more people. Uh, support, we, yeah, it would be nice to have more people. I think financial aid, we're pretty much covered. Marketing design, uh, same thing. We don't need a lot of people, but of course we always uh, uh, like to have some. Program, we need more people because we ideally want to do this redesign for next year. Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, web, we need more people because we want to do the redesign of the website uh, next year. Program always needs more people because it's a lot of work uh, to, to, all, to do all the hand-holding for the uh, speakers, and it's also a lot of work to select the talks themselves. Uh, then, depending on how we do media next year, uh, if, if we do hybrid, then we will need more people here as well. So I should have marked this in blue. Uh, conduct, we, it's a very small team. We don't need extra people there. Um, yeah, and that's it. So let me hop back again. Uh, I have the same question. Thank you for your talk. Can I sign up as a volunteer even if the conference is being held in person, 
next year I live in Brazil? So a very good question. Yes, of course you can, because the, um, the, the thing is that we are running this as an, um, the whole organization as an um, virtually, right? So there's a lot of work, let me just hide this and put this up here. There's a lot of work that can be done online. Um, and then of course you, you, can, you can attend the, the conference as well. Uh, and we very much appreciate if you'd, if you'd help us uh, before the conference. Like I mentioned in the timeline, the conference organization starts around January. So that would be a, like a perfect time to, to, uh, to join the organization. So let's see more questions. Is there a work group which usually lacks volunteers? I already covered that one. Uh, will there be something like an attendee voting on the context shown at? Yes. So this is a good question as well. Let me put that one up. So this is um, this attendee voting. This is actually what we call a talk voting. And the talk voting uh, is something that you, you see on, on our website, you see over here, you go to program and you go all the way down here to talk voting. So after the call for proposals, we then open the talk voting and you can kind of see it at the moment because it's closed, but talk voting basically um, allows you to, to vote for everything that has been submitted. And uh, probably the next question is who can participate? Anyone who has a conference ticket already bought for the for the conference coming up, so for EP 2022 can participate, but also all the previous attendees can also vote. So uh, this is a, a pretty democratic process. And then we use the talk voting as the basis for selecting the talks. So usually about two thirds of the talks get selected just based on the talk voting. And then the rest is then selected by the program work group on other criteria like diversity, like, uh, you know, including topics which are not as mainstream, but should still get a chance and these things. So that's how it works. Right. How many active people organized, uh, did organize Europython? So this up. Right. No, this one. Uh, so we had active people. We had uh, just over twenty for twenty for for this year's conference. So not a whole lot, but it worked decently well. I, I must say. I mean, we have an excellent team. We have lots of people doing lots of work, and because of that, we can actually pull this off with uh, you know this small number of people that we have. Um, I must also say that these online events are actually more work intense than the in-person events, because for the in-person events, we can get lots of external help. Uh, you know, you, we can just sign up with companies to, to do uh, certain things for us and that, but that's not easily possible with the online event because um, the, the tasks that you have to do are sometimes so special, you spend more time explaining those tasks than actually doing them yourself. So it's, uh, it's something that, doesn't work that well for the for the online events. Uh, something that has worked really well this year is we we got a company, the company that does the video recording for us. Usually, uh, we brought them in to help us with the um, you know managing the streamyard. So that has worked really well, and that's uh, definitely going to be something that we're going to do next year as well. So let me just check how much time I have left. So I have another few minutes. So let's see, more questions. What sort of contribution are you looking for hours per week? Again, very good question. Um, this again depends a bit on, uh, in, on, on the work group that you're working uh, in. So let's say if you do FinAid, for example, FinAid uh, just has a, a few weeks where FinAid uh, is, is being done. So in those few weeks, you will have to invest, I don't know, maybe two, three hours every week. 
to do the review process. Um, and of course, you know, help with the setup and so on a bit. So maybe uh, one week is a bit more work. Other uh, other uh, work groups like the, the communications work group, uh, that requires more work because you have to do quite a bit of um, you know, publishing of, of information. So uh, that closer to the conference is definitely around like maybe four hours a week. Um, if you do things like sponsors work group, that's a lot of work. Uh, before the conference, the weeks before the conference, and at the conference. So that's very intense. Um, and likewise, with uh, some of the others, like support, for example, it requires more work uh, during the event. For the in-person event, um, of course, you will you would be at the conference, right? So you can help there. So what we typically have is we have session chairs at the uh, in-person event who then take over the session share part. and. Um, and you can sign up for those things, you know, right before the conference. Right, so now I'm out of time. Thank you very much for all these questions. If you have more questions, then um, yeah, please just reach out to us. You can, you can reach us in the info desk. Uh, and now I'll take this off stage and we get to the next talk.